Hello, everyone. I, I hope and pray that everyone had a really Merry Christmas. And, uh, and b before I go any further, you know, here, I'd like to, I'd like to go to, to uh, a really, a true American hero that we lost, the uh, a Tuskegee Airman. You know, his name was Clifford E. Brooks, Sr., he served as a cryptologist with the Tuskegee Airmen in World War II, and he passed away on Friday night at the age of 99. You know, this is really, really dear to my heart in lots of ways. You know, if you just think about this generation, you know, the greatest generation, they've been reported as, as that way many, many times. But he was the last surviving Tuskegee Airman in the state of West Virginia. After the war, he lived in Kaiser, West Virginia. He worked at the Kelly Tire Plant in Cumberland. He dedicated time to the American Legion. He was a Mason, a member of the Moose Lodge, and he was active in the United Methodist Church in Kaiser. You know, absolutely, Clifford E. Brooks, Sr. should be remembered as an absolute American hero. He did so much. He helped us in every way he could. He served. 99 years he gave us wisdom in this great state. So to him and all of his family, we thank them so much. December the 28th. Tuesday, we have now lost 5,288 West Virginians. We lost an additional 37 since the last time we were together. The 5,252nd death in West Virginia, an 80-year-old female from Lincoln County. The 5,253rd death, a 75-year-old male from Greenberg County. The 5,254th death, a 44-year-old male from Kanawha County. The 5,255th death, an 82-year-old male from Wood County. The reason I always stop when I see an age of someone we've lost that's really young, it's a tragedy beyond belief, but I think about my kids, I think, my gosh, how tragic is this? A 31-year-old, the 52nd, 156th death, a 31-year-old from Raleigh County. The 5,257th death, a 73-year-old female from Upshur County. The 5,258th death, a 70-year-old female from Roan County. The 5,259th death, an 81-year-old male from Braxton County. The 5,260th death, a 64-year-old female from Raleigh County. The 5,261st death, a 63-year-old male from Cabell County. The 5,262nd death, a 73-year-old female from Wayne County. The 5,263rd death, a 53-year-old male from, from Harrison County. The 5,264th death, an 85-year-old male from Raleigh County. The 5,265th death, a 77-year-old female from Raleigh County. The 5,266th death, a 52-year-old male from Cabell County. The 5,267th death, a 71-year-old male from Fayette County. The 5,268th death, a 62-year-old male from Webster County. The 5,269th death, a 79-year-old female from Berkeley County. The 5,270th death, a 61-year-old male from Cabell County. The 5,271st death, a 78-year-old male from Ohio County. The 5,272nd death, a 38-year-old male from Kanawha County. The 5,273rd death, an 80-year-old male from Mineral County. The 5,274th death, a 68-year-old male from Wessel County. The 5,275th death, an 86-year-old female from Monroe County. The 5,276th death, a 42-year-old male from Logan County. The 5,277th death, a 70-year-old male from Wood County. The 5,278th death, a 70-year-old male from Braxton County. The 5,279th death, a 59-year-old female from Mingo County. 
The 5,280th death of 64-year-old male from Lewis County. The 5,281st death of 82-year-old male from Greenbrier County. The 5,282nd death of 73-year-old male from Mason County. The 5,283rd death of 75-year-old male from Lincoln County. The 5,284th death of 96-year-old male from Mercer County. The 5,285th death of 78-year-old male from Randolph County. The 5,286th death of 60-year-old female from Fayette County. The 5,287th death of 50-year-old female from Fayette County. The 5,288th death of 54-year-old male from Marion County. I'm really sorry. That gone, I hate it. I hate it so bad. 5,288 deaths in West Virginia. You know something? Just think about this. In this nation, I think yesterday they reported in excess of 500,000 new cases that day. Now, some of them could be carried over from over, over Christmas. But this Omicron virus, you know, or a variant rather, is uh, surely sweeping across this land. We really haven't seen it yet in West Virginia. But we have seen 5,288 deaths since way too many. Way, way, way too many. We've done a lot of good stuff in West Virginia, and we want to continue to do just that. You've got to absolutely hear me when I say you need to be vaccinated so badly. Without any question, you need to have your booster shot. But absolutely, if in this nation we had 500,000 new cases in a day, 500,000 in a day. And who knows where we're going? In West Virginia, our active cases are 8,604. We had 1,053 new cases. Our daily positivity rate jumped way, way, way up. I have not seen it this high yet. At 14.19%, that means we didn't test very many people and we got 1,053 new positive cases. Cumulative rates at 6.43. There's 309,000 plus that have recovered. Our, our hospital, hospitalized folks continue to eke up 635, 194 in the ICU units and 101 on ventilators. Right now, the number of folks that are in the hospitals that are on ventilators or, or in the ICU units, there's only 13% of those people that are there that are absolutely vaccinated. 13% are vaccinated and 87% of those that are in, in the ICU unit or, or, or on, that, are, or, that are on ventilators or in the ICU unit are 87% of them are unvaccinated. We have almost half of our counties in our state that are red, only two counties in the green. Uh, we have now jumped from three to 18 Omicron variant cases across the state, and it will surely skyrocket before this is over. The number of school outbreaks are 22, 15 counties with 272 confirmed cases. I remind you all the time, if you're 65 and above, you're in a danger zone right off the get-go. If you've got any kind of diabetes or lung conditions or heart conditions or whatever it may be, and absolutely, then you're right in the crosshairs. If you have any symptoms at all, go get a test right now. If we catch it early enough, these antibodies will save your life. I tell people over and over, if you're 65 and above, especially, and you're going into a crowd of people and you don't know who they are, and you have any compromising health conditions whatsoever, you need to wear a mask. From the standpoint of the FDA and everybody, everybody now is really encouraging your booster shots. And, uh, and, and, and you know, there's everything from a Pfizer study right on down that says over and over and over 
the booster shots absolutely will save your life. You cannot sit around and not get this done. We need you to really move and move faster and faster and faster to get this done. We have now given in the state of West Virginia 312,000 booster shots. Now let just ask yourself just this. If we hadn't been here, and we hadn't all been preaching nonstop to you, and we hadn't been out with Baby Dog and giving away stuff and doing stuff and encouraging people over and over and over, what would that number be? Would it be 312,649? Or would it be 250,000? Or would it be 225,000? Or would it be 100,000? Without any question, those people that have those booster shots those lives are being saved. Now, I can't absolutely articulate exactly the number of lives saved, but I'm going to tell you, we're not going to quit trying. We're not going to just lay down and be frustrated and say, oh, you know, we got a lot of people out there that won't listen at all. You know, we're not going to, and so we're just not going to do anything. That's not the answer. That's not the answer at all. The answer is keep digging. Keep doing exactly what West Virginians have done over and over and over. You know, I go back to Bette Midler. Let me just stay there just one second. Called as illiterate, called as poor, called as absolutely all the bad things that you could call somebody. And did it out of frustration about Senator Manchin. But absolutely took it out on the people of West Virginia. Well, I'm going to tell you this, just like what we're doing as far as being here and trying to encourage and doing everything we can do as tirelessly as we can possibly do it, trying with Dr. Marsh and General Hoyer and Dr. Amjad and Secretary Crouch and all kinds of testimonials and everything from all kinds of different people, all the efforts, all the effort, efforts we can make, you know, even with the Bulldog. And everything we've done, over and over and over, we just kept digging, didn't we? That's what West Virginians do. What Bette Midler, you know, wants to criticize. We get dirty because we perform. We absolutely get dirt on our hands because we work. And that's what we're going to keep doing. We got 64.7% of the, of the people that are five years old and older now have received at least one shot. 71% of the 18 and older have received one shot. 83%, 83.2% of the 50 and older have received one shot. And 91% of our 65 and older have received one shot. But now get this, and these numbers are really jumping. At one point in time, not long ago, we had 21%, I think, 21% of the 50 and older had gotten their booster shot. Now we're at 44.9. We've doubled. We have doubled the number of 50 and older that have gotten their, first, their booster shot. I think at that point in time, if I remember correctly, and I could be wrong about this, but we had 24% of the 65 and older have gotten their first shot. Now we're at 51% have got. I'm sorry, 24% had gotten their booster shot, 65 and older. Now, we're at 50.8%. We're at 51%. Doubled it. Doubled it. Doubled it getting dirty, getting your hands dirty, working, working. Absolutely, and that's what we're going to continue to do because every single one of those people we get across the finish line may very well be a life we save. I ask, our, I ask our parents and our grandparents over and over, help me get the, help me get the kids vaccinated. It's really, really important. All the, the information on the vaccine info line is up there. Um, take advantage of all this free testing. Again, thank Truth and uh, Walgreens for all that they've done. And, uh, you know, they continue to just have done great, great, great stuff. Um, we got 50 outbreaks in our long-term care facilities and no outbreaks in our church community. It's wonderful. We have 44 inmate cases and 50, 51 staff cases. That's great work by corrections. I remind you about your flu shot over and over and over. 
Take advantage of this rental assistance program. It expires soon, and absolutely all the information is right there. You've got to call us and everything. We could absolutely, if you can qualify, if you're a renter or you're a landlord, we'll get you some money, and that, and that, that can help in lots of different ways. And I encourage everybody about giving blood. So, so, so important and everything. And the Red Cross needs us to step up. And, and for those people that have, have gotten COVID and, and survived this terrible killer and everything, surely, surely take time to at least think about giving blood. You know, you, you've been given an incredible blessing by your survival and, uh, you know, getting through this terrible pandemic and everything. And if you've gotten it, please consider giving blood. It's really important. And uh, last thing I'd end up with is, uh, you know, I, I said this. In, in the briefing or the, the announcement that we just made, but, you know, West Virginia has honored me in lots of different ways, and there's days that you've had to make some really tough decisions. You know, our Supreme Court was a mess, and we had lost our integrity, and people were getting prosecuted, and all kinds of stuff was going on, and then it came to me that I needed to appoint three new Supreme Court judges, something that's never happened to a governor before. And I selected three people, Tim Armstead, Evan Jenkins, and John Hutchinson. And they're now our judges, or justices, along with two others. But absolutely, you had to make the right choice. And I stand firmly behind those three because they, made, they absolutely now have helped with the two judges or justices there. But now we have five justices that are doing one whale of a job. And they are doing absolute great work, and the integrity of that court is restored. Now today, in addition to that, I named brand new that I that I championed the, the the charge. You know, with a lot, a lot, a lot of people right with me. I thank the legislature. I especially thank Charlie Trump and everything. But uh, whether it be Pres <clears throat> President Craig Blair or Speaker Robert Han uh, uh, Roger Hanshaw, you know the 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 great work that everybody did, you know, I go back to the 2019 State of the State Address where I said we need an intermediate, you know, appeals court. And, 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 and so we put it up and it didn't make it. And we put it up again and it didn't make it. And then in, in the 2021 uh, State of the State Address, we put it up again and it made it. And so today, I appointed those three judges today Again, I've got to make the right choice, don't I? Appointing a bad judge would be absolutely terrible. We need to appoint, appoint the right judges with the right values and conservative values that speak the voice of the people. That's what we want our courts to be, the voice of West Virginians, a place that's business friendly and where we want people to come and bring opportunities within our, to our state. And so with all of that, the three people that I appointed today, you know, were, and, and, and I'm going to give their official name, Thomas E. Scar, you know, uh, you know, was appointed to the two and a half year term that will expire on December 31st, 2024. He's from, Tom's from Huntington. I've known Tom a long time. He's an absolute superstar. Then Dan Greer, or Daniel Greer, Daniel W. Greer. You know, and all of us around Charleston know Dan. Dan's been around in, in many different roles, and I appointed him, I, I, I previously appointed him as a judge, but Dan will do a great job. Dan has incredible values, insight, knowledge. He's a super smart guy. And so, so with all that, I'm sure Dan will be a wonderful judge and everything. He's going to serve the four-year term, four-and-a-half-year term that's going to expire on December 31st, 2026. And also, I appointed Donald E. Nickerson, Jr. And Don, Donald is, uh, lives in Wheeling, and he is, he's just been a superstar beyond belief. He's the municipal judge in Wheeling right now and an Ohio County commissioner. And, uh, and, and, and so, absolutely, I know, I just know what a superstar Donald is in every way. I just, I am so pleased, and I stand by this wholeheartedly. It's been an absolute once in history situation where the governor has appointed these people, you know, to the Supreme Court and now the Intermediate Court of Appeals like this and, and all at one time. 
Now, it is a one-time deal, but you had to get it right. You had to absolutely get it right because this will shape our state for decades and decades to come. You had to get it right. And I absolutely stand absolutely firm by my convictions and everything that these are the right choices. So I'm very, very proud of these people and I congratulate them and I really appreciate them stepping up and saying that, saying that they'll serve. So with all that, that's all I got right now. Thank you, Governor. Let's now go to Dr. Clay Marsh, our coronavirus czar. Well, good afternoon. In keeping with what the governor said, uh, we are starting to see the impact of the Omicron variant around the United States. Yesterday, we reported 543, I think, thousand cases, new cases of COVID-19, which our previous highest single day record was about 303,000. So some of these cases, as the governor said, maybe catch up from the holidays, but we know that the Omicron variant is, is contagious in a manner that really is very much different than we've ever seen before. Again, remember the Delta variant, which was considered one of the most infectious respiratory viruses in our modern day history was, uh, was outcompeted head to head in the US in three weeks by the Omicron variant. And as we start to look at the impact of the Omicron variant around the country, we also see that there is a substantial impact on the occurrence in children that are hospitalized. About 35% increase in hospitalizations with children testing positive over the last week. And in some places like in Washington, DC, about half of the children that are testing and that are going into a hospital actually are testing positive for the, uh, for the Omicron variant or for COVID-19 with the presumption that's the Omicron variant. Now, we know from South Africa that in a case by case level, and that seems to have also been followed in the United Kingdom, uh, and this is data specifically out of Britain, that perhaps there is a reduced severity um, from Omicron on a person to person basis. And some of the work from South Africa suggested that children that were hospitalized that tested positive for the Omicron variant in South Africa may not have been sick from the Omicron variant specifically, but because of the incredible spread, uh, it just gives, the, it gives us an idea about how much impacted our child uh, pediatric population are by this infectious agent. However, we also know that here in the US that, that the COVID-19, the Omicron variant can also cause primary problems. And now we're also seeing the flu start to ramp up as well as other respiratory viruses. So this is a really important time as we've talked about, not only for our elder West Virginians to get fully vaccinated and boosted and our West Virginians with multiple you know, other health uh, issues, but also for our children. And when we look at the vaccination rates in our children, we see that be our lowest vaccination rate. And that's something that all parents should really become acutely aware of. And this is uh, immediately the time to decide to fully vaccinate um, our children to help protect them from the spread of the Omicron variant and COVID-19 in West Virginia. As the governor said, we are behind the rest of the country when it comes to the incidence of Omicron as a cause of COVID-19 spread. In our last genetic, genetic sequencing run, we found about 3.2% of the tests, the cases that were tested to be Omicron. But if we really isolate it to the immediate seven days before the testing was, was finished on the genetic variants, that number was about 6%. So we know as we are going forward that Omicron now is starting to gain uh, a share of the number of, um, of COVID-19 cases in West Virginia. And we saw in the US that Omicron went from 
3% of the cases to 13% of the cases, then to 74% of the cases. And almost certainly we will follow in West Virginia. Two big um, important findings that, that's happened in the last uh, few days. Number one is the Centers for Disease Control has modified their recommendations for isolation if you test positive or for quarantine if you're exposed to somebody who is positive. From an isolation standpoint, if you're fully vaccinated within, uh, within the uh, six month window with two vaccines of Pfizer and Moderna, or within the uh, two month window of Johnson and Johnson, or you're fully vaccinated with a booster, then if you test positive, you only need to isolate for five days. Previously, it was 10 days. And if you're afebrile and or if you don't have other acute symptoms, then you're safe to go out after that five day period with a good uh, face mask around other people because the finding is that Omicron, which is now the dominant form of COVID-19 in our country, affects people uh, one to two days before they test positive or develop symptoms and then two to three days afterwards. It's faster on and faster off. So that's really the, the genesis of the recommendation to reduce by about half the time that people need to isolate who are fully vaccinated or who are actively immune within those, those ranges that I mentioned. If you, uh, if you contact somebody who is positive for COVID-19 as, a, as, a, um, as an exposure, then if you're fully vaccinated within the six month time window for Pfizer and Moderna or the two month time window for Johnson and Johnson, or you're fully vaccinated and boosted, you don't have to isolate. You should wear a mask around other people and test at five days if possible and keep the mask on for a total of 10 days. If you become symptomatic, you should get tested. If you're not fully vaccinated or you fall outside the windows of the six months, if you're over six months from your second dose of Pfizer or Moderna, or two months after your first dose of Johnson & Johnson, and you haven't been uh, uh, boosted, then you should isolate uh, as a quarantine for five days. Uh, test at that point, and if you're negative, then you could continue, you can go back out again, wear a mask for five more days just to protect other people. This guidance will be beneficial for our healthcare enterprise and other industries like the airline industry, so that we are still promoting safe um, safety for people who are infected with COVID-19 and for others around them, but also allow us to continue to help the workforce uh, move back into, into normal activities and our population to do the things they'd like to do in a shorter time window. Uh, the other um, two issues that came out is that we now have two oral medications, Paxlovid and Molnupiravir, that are going to be available for West Virginians. And we're going through now the careful instruction for pharmacies and, and prescribing physicians. Both of these medicines have interactions with other medications and have some uh, contraindications. So it's gonna be important for us to use these in a very smart way, since we don't have a huge number of them to begin with, but also in a very safe way so that we can make sure that the people that are prescribed are people that will benefit and not be harmed by these medications. As a reminder, these medications are, are most beneficial if used within five days of onset of symptoms. So that's the reason why it's really important to test and to then communicate to your primary care physician quickly if you are at risk over 65 years old or have other chronic medical problems, because these drugs are really good at keeping people out of the hospital and helping uh, reduce death uh, from COVID-19. Lastly, it's clear now, and the governor really alluded to this during his initial comments, but it's clear that because of the vaccine uptake that we have seen a smaller share of the deaths from older Americans and older West Virginians. And now Americans in that 45 to 55 year old range and that 25 
to 45 year old range are starting to have more of the relative percent of deaths related to COVID-19. And this is a completely preventable and, um, and treatable issue if people do get fully vaccinated and boosted. And it really does demonstrate the benefit of full vaccination and boosting related to protection from hospitalization and death from COVID-19 as even though more older Americans and older West Virginians are dying as an absolute number at a relative percent basis, we're seeing some reduction in older people's deaths and some increase in the middle-aged uh, population and the um, up to 50, 55 year old population's death share. Um, the last thing I'd like to say is that Israel is considering now a fourth boost they went through their assessment as we do with the FDA and the CDC in Israel. They decided to hold at this point to give the fourth dose and they're doing some further research trying to understand the science. But it does appear that at least from the data they have currently, the people that are four months after their, their booster dose seem to have a higher incidence of breakthrough infections uh, versus people that are within that four month window. So more to follow, Israel's a leader, but it's something that we're keeping a very close eye on because of the vulnerability of our population and the fact that many of our elders, nursing home residents and older West Virginians have gotten the first and second shots and boosters the longest time ago. So we're paying a lot of attention to that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Marsh. Next, we'll go to retired Major General Jim Hoyer, the director of our Joint Interagency Task Force. Good afternoon. I'd like to reinforce a couple uh, things that the governor pointed out, uh, why we keep digging and why we keep pressing so hard and we're not going to give up is, as the governor pointed out today, we did hit 71% of the over age 18 population with one dose. So we know by continuing to educate, continuing to, to tell the importance of the vaccines and to provide incentives, we are getting to a significant portion of our population. But why is that so important? I wanna leave you with a couple of pieces of, of data. Uh, number one, uh, today we hit 95 new admissions in the hospital. That's up from 75 yesterday. And it's up from uh, 45 on the 19th of December. So we know we've got to continue to press. Uh, as Dr. Marsh pointed out, there are some new uh, antivirals coming out. Uh, we still have the antibodies, but they are both uh, in nationally in short supply and are not gonna be largely available and the antivirals uh, have significant restrictions on who can uh, use those, as well as the antibodies are going to have less impact on the Omicron variant. Uh, the other piece of data important to point out is we press so hard to get our older population, age 50 and above, uh, vaccinated. And we have seen a significant drop in the average age of death in our state. Uh, that is attributed to the work that we've done with our older population, but unfortunately also with Omicron is now going to uh, be impacted by the fact that it is infecting uh, and having a greater impact on a younger uh, population. The last thing to reinforce the governor's point is to why we keep digging so hard and why we're not going to stop, why we're going to continue to press to educate people. Uh, Dr. Marsh and I had an opportunity yesterday to speak to the father of a uh, family of four. Uh, the father had been fully uh, vaccinated and boosted with Pfizer. The mother fully vaccinated and boosted with Moderna. Six-year-old child fully vaccinated with the pediatric doses. And then a three-year-old child who, of course, cannot be vaccinated. On Christmas Eve, the entire family started to become sick. Uh, they had a, a, a terrible day on Christmas, uh, went to the urgent care uh, uh, the next day on Sunday, all four tested positive. 
for the virus. Uh, we talked to them again this morning and the family has effectively weathered uh, the storm on uh, the infections. And the one thing that the father reinforced to us is, thank goodness that West Virginia was pressing to make vaccines available. Because I'm not sure how our family would have weathered this without them. So I leave you with that. Continue to press your friends, your neighbors, your relatives. The best treatment, the best thing that we have to get past this going forward is the vaccination, the vaccine. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, we'll go to Dr. Ainam Jadar, State Health Officer. Good morning. This is just a friendly reminder for all our um, school-age children and teachers and staff for the um, holiday season that we are working on testing events at some school locations. And once those are available, um, we'll post that to our DHHR website for testing. Um, these are optional. They're going to be free. But also to remind everyone, we have a lot of testing around the state that's still available, and we encourage you to go to those sites. Thanks, George. Thank you. Next, we'll go to questions from members of the media. The first today from Paul Mullen with WCBC. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. Good to be back. Um, President Biden recently came out with a statement that said that um, the federal response was um, – I don't know. I, I, like he said, that they had played all their cards. Uh, and we get the word from CDC now that we are reducing in, uh, the isolation period from 10 to 5 days during a time where there is an alarm out about Omicron that, uh, you know, it's about ready to hit hard. Uh, are are Governor, I'd like to get your reaction and the reaction of the medical team to the uh, situation and uh, how difficult that makes your job in trying to sell this as a, a bad new variant coming on when the variant itself uh, is not really producing any alarm at the federal level. Thank you. Oh, Paul, I, I, I think the, uh, I think the new variant is producing incredible alarm at the federal level. The, the, uh, the federal level's response now is, tell you what we're going to do, we're going to put this back in the state's hands. Now, just think about this. And, Paul, my reaction is, what in the world next? What in the world is it going to come out of Washington next? Now just think about this for just one second, Paul. You know, in the Hoosiers movie, Jimmy, at the end of the movie, when the game was on the line, he said, I'll make it, coach. You know, if you'll give me the ball, I'll make it. I'll make the shot. Well, really and truly, you know, Joe's had the ball. President Biden's had the ball. You know, and now what there's, he's saying is, no, 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 I don't want this thing. You, you take it. You take it, states. And they've had, they've had control of the testing, the vaccines, the antibodies, the money, the, the COVID, new COVID pills, the medicine, all the supply chain, they've had control of all of that. And even going all the way back to, to President Trump, who I thought did a miraculous job, and I had hoped and prayed, and I want us to all be respectful of the presidency in every way. But now just think about this. President Biden came in and says, I'm going to stop this. I'm going to stop this. And way, way, way more now have died on his watch than on President Trump's watch. Way more. And nobody knew what to do when this thing hit brand new, brand spanking new on President Trump's watch. No vaccine, no nothing. Way more people have died now. You know, our coronavirus czar, you know, Clay Mars, Dr. Mars just said, 500,000 plus, 543,000 new cases in a day 
in one day. And control, Paul, control of everything, just like I said, the testing, the vaccines, the antibodies, the monies, the supply chain, control of everything they had, everything. They mandated, they did everything under the sun, everything you could do, and now say, nope, we don't want this. We want the states to handle this. Now, Paul, you know, concern? Are you kidding me? They're panicked because they don't know what to do. They have repeatedly given us information and then gone back and changed and changed and changed and changed. Dr. Fauci, how many times? How many times have we said, wear the mask, don't wear the mask, do this, do that? How many times have we done all that, Paul? Over and over and over. The inconsistency out of Washington, it is an absolute dog's mess over and over and over. You leave it to the states, we'll clean it up. We'll get it right. We've gotten it right here in West Virginia. But, you know, it, uh, it's not very fair. It's not very fair to have control of everything and then say, no, no, you handle it, states. That's not, very, that's not an answer. So my, my answer in the beginning was, and that's exactly what it is, but we'll fix it. We'll fix it. If they hand it back to the states, we'll fix it. All right. I'm a firm believer, you know, in just this. And, uh, you know, and I said this a long time ago. You know, when the game's on the line, I tell my team, and y'all are just going to have to just put up with me just a second. You'll see me coaching on the sidelines a lot of times. I'll be scream, screaming, the count's 3-2. The count's 3-2. Well, my players know what that means. And that, what that means is just this. When the count's 3-2, and the team that is batting, is, this is their last bats, and you're one run ahead. You're one run ahead, and you're standing there pounding your glove on second base. You're one run ahead. The count's 3-2. There's two outs. The bases are loaded. Pounding your glove. The count's 3-2. You're one run ahead. Are you standing there pounding your glove saying, Lord, please, please don't let them hit me the ball? Because I don't want to muff this up and make a mistake and us lose the game. If you're pounding your gloves saying, please don't let them hit me the ball, I don't think you're ever going to be much of nothing. You've got to convince yourself, we all make mistakes. You've got to convince yourself wholeheartedly, I want the ball. Hit it to me. I'll make the play. Now, we all make mistakes. But I'll promise you, I'm standing there pounding my gloves saying, hit me the ball. I'll make the play. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of absolutely daring myself to try to make the play. Because I think that's what you need in leadership. You don't need this now after you've had all this control and all these mistakes and all this bad communication and everything else under the sun and then say, Leave it to the states. You know, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me coming from Washington? No, I tell you, that's not me, Paul. I want the ball. All right, thank you, Paul. Next, we'll go to Steve Adams with Ogden Newspapers. Yeah, Steve Adams with Ogden Newspapers here. Wanted to get your reaction now that it's your nursing plan has been out for a few days. I know the West Virginia Nurses Association has uh, uh, pushed back on it. They haven't felt like they were part of the discussion in developing this plan. Uh, they support the education component and bringing nurses on board, but they don't feel that the current plan does anything to retain uh, nurses now that might even be considering uh, joining the 1,700 nurses who have uh, not renewed their licenses over the last year. Wanted to get your reaction to uh, their reaction. Thank you. Well, Stephen, I, I think it's more of just a uh, miscommunication maybe than anything, but, uh, but it's a little disappointing to tell you the honest truth when, you, when, you've, uh, when you've pumped money after money after money to try to help the hospitals and the hospitals are supposed to be helping the nurses. We put, I think, I don't remember exactly the number, but 57 or $58 million in uh, saving our care right off the get-go because we had to do that to keep nurses from going out of states and everything else and doing all kinds of different things, to try to just do that. 
help with, the, with their pay, help with incentives, help with all kinds of, we did it right off the get-go. 57 or $58 million went right to that. That came out of the state treasury and went right to the hospitals. And the hospitals were supposed to take care of the nurses and do all kinds of stuff. Now with all of this, there's two more components that absolutely are for retention of nurses and recruitment of nurses into West Virginia. This is not, this is not just an education deal, you know, which the education deal is fantastic because it is basically trying to, to grow us 2,000 new nurses in four years in West Virginia, but it is an immediate infusion of money, you know, as well in recruitment and, and retention also. So, so with, that, with all that being said, it's disappointing. You know, it's disappointing. I mean, you know, when you, when you work your tail off and everything, and we did all kinds of work, you know, in, in, in consulting with uh, Delegate Pack and, 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 and a, a group of 400 nurses there and, and all kinds of stuff like that, you know, but we, we, did a, we did a lot of consulting on this and everything. But coming up with a program, you know, and, and, and basically creating a program where you're going to grow you're going to grow nurses, you're going to retain, you're going to recruit and everything. And, and here's the president of 48, or the president of, for, present of $48 million and have, have almost anyone and everyone, you know, not everyone, but have anyone frustrated for that and everything? You know, it's surely, it's surely disappointing on my side. All right, thank you, Stephen. Next to Charles Young with WV News. Hi, this is Charles Young with WV News. Uh, my question is for General Hoyer. Um, sir, could you elaborate a little bit about what you said about the state's uh, supply of monoclonal antibodies? Um, you know, is that still widely available? And what do you anticipate the supply being like in, in the coming weeks? Thank you, sir. Yes, so Charles, uh, there is still a national shortage of monoclonal antibodies and also the new antivirals that are coming out are gonna be in limited supply. So there are two things related to the antibodies and uh, uh, maybe Dr. Amjad can, can help me out on the medical side of things. But uh, as we see the Omicron variant take greater uh, percentage of cases nationally, uh, some of the antibodies are not as effective against the, the new variant. So you're gonna have that issue as well as a limited supply issue. Uh, we do not on a regular basis and have not for a couple of months now received the total number of antibodies uh, that we request nationally, nor have other states. So there, there, there are both supply chain issues as well as the, uh, the new variant uh, and, and its effectiveness with certain antibodies. Thank you, Charles. Governor, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, I just had one, one other thought, you know, in regard to the nursing before, before we leave that and everything. Uh, I, I, I think really and truly, if we're really fair, I think, you know, that uh, the introduction of this program and everything, you know, the, uh, when, when people really understand, and I think that, that's why I said misunderstanding, you know, because uh, I think when people really understand and, and reflect on what we've done, they'll, you know, from the nursing, you know, the, the, the nursing association or whomever it may be, you know, I think they'll uh, embrace in a lot better way, you know, because once they understand there is real money there for immediate need, you know, just like, and they, and they understand absolutely uh, the 57 or $8 million that we put into the you know, saving our care from the hospitals. And, and, and you know, from the, from the immediate need of, uh, of recruitment and retention, we absolutely want to address that, no question, but we absolutely have to address how we're gonna get more. How are we gonna create more? You know, I mean, that, that in itself is a real challenge. Now we could try to, we could dump all the money that we have in, in, in retention but if we just retain, you know, we have got a big hole in the bucket here. That's all there is to it, a big hole in the bucket. You've got, a, you know, you've lost se of 1,700 nurses that didn't retain or, or, or renew their license, 
68% of them said they're just worn out. They're just tired. I mean, for crying out loud, you know, you can do any and everything you can possibly do, but if you don't have more able bodies, you're in real trouble, real trouble. The only other thing I would add is just this, is uh, uh, we have 95 new admissions to hospitals, you know, across our state in the last day. Remember what General Hoyer said before, the target is 60. When we exceed 60, we're getting in trouble. You know, we've had days of 78 and, and days of 68 and, and, and many days that we're above that 60 level. You know, that's not good. The other thing I said to you a little while ago was that uh, you know, we have jumped significantly, not enough, in our older, uh, uh, over 50 or over 65 or whatever it may be, of people getting their booster shots. 300 and some thousand people in West Virginia have gotten a booster shot now. And that is up way, you know, I, I remember when we were sitting at 47 or 48,000, we hardly couldn't get off that. Well, that's six times that now. And, you know, in doing all that and everything, all this effort uh, that you hear these words from General Hoyer or you hear them from Dr. Marsh or Dr. Amjad or me, you know, you see us go out, you know, with the do it for baby dog stuff and keep working it and everything. And the hours are long. The hours are really long. And you think, well, how can they tirelessly keep doing this? Well, you don't do it tirelessly, you know, because you get tired. You know, that's all there is to it. And you wonder a lot of times, really, is it worth it? Is it really worth it? And then all of a sudden you get a hold of yourself real quick and you say, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Just think of the numbers of people that truly we saved their lives. And that's what this is all about. So we just do what West Virginians have done so, so many times. Get your hands dirty. Work. That's just exactly what we do. You know, uh, I'd ask you just this question, who do you know, who do you know out there that has taken a vaccination shot and dropped over dead? Who do you know? I mean, I'm sure it may have happened because we can't say never on anything here, but who do you know? I've never heard of that happening, but yet who do you know that's gotten COVID and died? 5,288 of them in West Virginia. Just think, it's just terrible. It is absolutely terrible. Those shots are almost harmless to you. You need to take them without any question. And the other thing from the standpoint of my frustration, from the standpoint of our federal government, I mean, just look at what's going on in our federal government. Think about it. Think about how in the world we could come up with an idea to defund the police. Think about the ideas that have come out of our government. You watched Afghanistan on TV. You absolutely watch what's going on in our border. You see crime all over the place and you see inflation shooting right through the roof. And now, and now all of a sudden we've got 500,000, 543,000 new COVID cases in a day. And our federal government with complete control, mandating and everything else, complete control says, nope, we want the states to handle it. Like I said, you know, uh, you know, the old saying, lost is a ball in high weeds. You know, lots of times when we played ball in the backyards or whatever like that, when somebody hit the ball and it roll over, you know, into a lot that was not developed or whatever it may be, it roll into an area where the weeds were a little higher. It was always really tough to find. Is that not what Washington is? You know, lost as a ball in high weeds. And really, at the end of the day, you got to have leaders that want the ball. And I've told you many, many times, I'm not afraid to want the ball. But with all this and everything, I tell you, we've got... We've got big time issues across this great country. We'll survive it. We'll get through this pandemic. 
The only way we're going to get there, though, is to have leaders and to have people, all of our people, absolutely holding hands and pulling the rope together. I go back to the, the very thing that I ride with a lot of times, and that's that bulldog. And I look at baby dog's face, and she makes a smile. And absolutely, without any question, she loves everybody. If we could just carry that sentiment forward, with true leadership, we'll get there. Sorry for the preaching. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you all so much. And Merry Christmas to you. I hope everyone had an incredible Christmas and Happy New Year on the way. So thank you so much.